So um, uh, the remit of my talk is pretty broad and uh, I have uh, mainly uh, done a case-based discussion over here. So three things um, I'll be uh, trying to um, discuss through the talk. First is when do you use a combined approach when you are doing an ACDF? Uh, what is uh, non-union after ACDF and thoughts on that and dysphagia uh, after ACDF. <coughs> so as we all know that uh, the indications of ACDF are uh, radiculopathy, myelopathy, uh, traumatic disruption of the uh, cervical uh, spine, tumors and infections, but that usually uh, you need a corpectomy in many of those cases. And to treat kyphosis also, which could be the sequelae of infection or trauma, which also uh, many times needs corpectomy. So selection of the approach, uh, there's a question about whether you go uh, front or you combine with front and back. So that decision depends on a lot of factors. So uh, the things which cross my mind are, can the job be done using a single approach only? Uh, single approach is usually less morbid than a combined approach. Where the, is the pathology? Is it anterior or posterior or indeed both? And how many levels need to be spanned? Uh, then you need to consider the natural history of the pathology, whether it's a trauma, tumor, or infection. And even if you, uh, you know, can you answer the question, can the mobilization of the patient be delayed a little bit? Uh, another factor which we should always consider uh, before making this decision is, has the patient had previous neck surgery? So uh, for a combined approach uh, in trauma, usually if there's a three-column disruption, then we used a combined approach, a front and back as one procedure, or you could stage it also. In infection and tumor pathology, when two or more level corpectomy is needed, then usually it's a front and back uh, approach in my uh, book. And in degenerative cases, where you've done a single-sided approach, but unfortunately at the end of the surgery, you, um, a patient wakes up with worsening neurodeficit, then you have to do posterior approach uh, as well to decompress or vice versa. So we all know anterior is the Smith-Robinson approach uh, and it is shown in the figure where you go uh, medial to the sternocleidomastoid and the vessels and lateral to the uh, trachea and esophagus. And posterior is uh, a standard midline approach. So now I'm going to just discuss some cases uh, where the decision making is uh, about based on single front or front and back. So this is the first case, a 61-year-old gentleman who has got a myeloma this myeloma has recurred after two, three years. It is not uh, responding to chemo now. He presented with neck pain for uh, two months and uh, neuro deficit uh, in the form of difficulty walking for about a week. And clinically, uh, his, he was a quadruparatic with grossly three out of five in both upper and lower limbs. And we have an MRI picture um, which is shown, uh, which shows uh, uh, metastasis and mostly pathological fracture of a vertebra and a cord compression. So I will take you through the other images. Uh, these are the um, CT scans uh, done. So it shows the facets involved uh, in C5 and C4, parasagittal scans, and the body of C5 and partially of C4 also involved. In the coronal scan, you can see uh, C5 is completely destroyed, and four, the left side is uh, uh, destroyed. Tumor is not sensitive to chemo. So um, in this um, case, um, I would think that a combined approach is needed because pathology is um, not responsive to chemo and it is also front and back pathology. So this is what um, I would uh, say uh, uh, is probably needed. So we uh, did a corpectomy of C5, put a cage, we saved C4 uh, as uh, it was intact on the right side and uh, we did a front and back uh, um, uh, fusion. So um, this case demonstrates uh, that if the pathology is front and back and not responding to chemo, then I would go for a front and back uh, approach. So uh, I'm going to just discuss a, a few more cases uh, which illustrate this approach point. Now this is another case uh, which I have treated, a 31-year-old uh, gentleman who presented with a, an acute C5 disc with quadruparesis following a a motorcycle accident. Now, uh, imaging shows no major bony injury in the front or, or back, but an acute uh, uh, C56 uh, disc with cord signal chain. So in this case, 
Uh, again, you know, pathology is entirely anterior, no bony injury. So definitely would go for a uh, front approach only. Now, in these cases, which are due to trauma, although there is no major obvious uh, MRI uh, destruction of the posterior elements, I still uh, keep them in collar and do a flexion extension at six weeks and then only decide whether I would uh, uh, do a further posterior if there is instability. Coming to the uh, next case, uh, another case of um, uh, RTA with polytrauma, lung and rib injuries and an extensive uh, cord injury uh, with a 356 three column injury. He also had fractures on the right side of the lateral masses of C3, C5 and C6. Pedicle of C5 was also involved, C5 body was involved. He had a dense quadriplegia with the high level and cord edema going up to C4. He also had dyspnea uh, when he presented uh, because of the injury. So further imaging um, showed um, the fractures as uh, mentioned earlier, right-sided lateral masses involved. Uh, and these are uh, further uh, imaging which shows that. And uh, again, in this case, because um, the injury is anterior and posterior, um, his uh, C5, 6 ACDF from the front and posterior, and uh, uh, this was a polytrauma patient, so we had to mobilize him as soon as possible. So that was the reason uh, we had to do a front and back approach. This is another case, uh, a 46 year old uh, with a C4-5 subluxation stroke dislocation with quadruparesis uh, because of a diving accident in the shallow water. Now uh, imaging shows uh, um, anterior um, uh, subluxation with a disc which has migrated posteriorly and perched facets. So uh, for him the management was skull traction. Uh, for some time till we get the OR ready and uh, surprisingly it has reduced very nicely uh, and the neurology was intact. Uh, after that we proceeded with a front, and, uh, front approach only and six weeks we did flexion extension, no instability, so no posterior uh, work was needed. Another case of trauma where there is an extensive um, uh, injury, quadruparesis, he presented a week post injury. And he walked into the uh, clinic in spite of uh, this injury after uh, one week. So again, he has posterior uh, injury also and he has uh, facet joint injuries also. Uh, these are his uh, CT scans which show a perch fa facets 4, 5 and 5, 6 and 4, 5 on the left side. Now in this case, uh, again, uh, the initial uh, management was a two level uh, ACDF and then um, I have mobilized him with a collar. You can see that the 4 5 facet is slightly uh, distracted, but we are going to wait and uh, watch on him. And if he shows obvious instability at six weeks, then we'll proceed with the uh, posterior. Uh, last case this is a tumor uh, infection pathology. A 49 year old with miliary tuberculosis, neck pain for six months, and he presented with two weeks of quadruparesis. The C5 6 uh, destroyed with kyphosis and uh, retropulsion as you can see on his MRI and CT. So again, this is uh, a, a significant uh, um, pathology with uh, two bodies involved. So he is going to need a two body corpectomy. Uh, and in this case, you always uh, go for front and back uh, fixation because only anterior would be insufficient um, in this case. So posteriorly, we had C7 pedicle screws and uh, C4 lateral mass screws and anteriorly two level corpectomy. So a uh, quick word on uh, non-union. So non-union after ACDF in my experience is, uh, you know, very few cases, although the literature says that the incidence is 5 to 50 percent, but a symptomatic non-union, um, you know, uh, I think uh, I'm struggling to find a symptomatic non-union. So majority are radiological cases, although the literature is really high uh, in the non-union. And uh, patient, patient who are chronic smokers, elderly patients, osteoporosis, these are the risk factors mentioned. Uh, nowadays, more and more biomechanical studies are suggesting that the cervical sagittal balance also, uh, if it is bad and if there is excessive slope uh, leading to shear forces on the ACDF, then uh, it causes uh, predisposes to non-union. Multi-level uh, ACDFs also predispose to non-unions more. So it's a single level ACDF. The quoted uh, rate of non-union is 10%, two level 20% non-union, and three level 30% non-union according to the uh, recent papers and review articles. And the reasons speculated are over-distraction and damage of the end plates, 
insufficient end plate uh, uh, preparation and subsidence. Uh, a lot of my colleagues over here, uh, they do ACDFs in degenerative cases without any screw fixation, so standalone cages. And there's no evidence uh, to say that standalone cages are more prone to non-union than with fi fixation. Another topic which uh, uh, is um, of relevance here is dysphagia after uh, anterior cervical surgery. So literature says that nearly 70% of uh, all patients with uh, anterior surgery have early post-operative dysphagia. But luckily, over the long term, it reduces to 5 to 10%. And very few patients have uh, long-term uh, dysphagia. So uh, the um, e esophageal ischemia and refer perfusion injury is said to be the cause of this. And uh, sometimes you can get uh, uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve injury also, which can lead to voice issues. So that is a different topic, which I have not uh, uh, included in this. Uh, dysphagia is a subjective complaint, but there are also patient-reported outcome measures, scores, uh, which we can use to um, uh, quantify it. And the gold standard is this uh, video fluoroscopic swallow evaluation. And the risk factors for dysphagia after anterior cervical surgery uh, are multi-level surgery, prolonged surgery, use of fixed retractors. So I used to use fixed retractors initially, and then nowadays I don't use fixed retractors, the assistants uh, retract. And I have found anecdotally that with, with, after I've stopped using the fixed retractors, the, uh, the dysphagia rate has come down. Uh, thicker plate also leads to dysphagia because it uh, irritates. A BMP is also uh, shown to use of local BMP, but in India we don't use BMP. Uh, in US also, I think in the cervical spine, more and more people have stopped using BMP. Revision surgery, uh, more dissection, so that is another cause of dysphagia. So, uh, you know, how to reduce uh, this incidence of dysphagia? So obviously all these risk factors we have to avoid quick surgery, no fixed retractors, use a, a low profile plate, avoid the BMP, and uh, you know, if it is a revision surgery, can you do it from posterior? Uh, and also, a uh, uh, lot of uh, my colleagues, and now I have also started using local steroid uh, before closure, and that helps the, reduce the dysphagia after anterior cervical surgery. Uh, you know, dysphagia is the initial bit, you know, but esophageal injury, you know, also eventually is going to cause dysphagia. But that, again, is a different topic. Thankfully, the incidence of esophageal injury is um, uh, extremely low, and I haven't so far seen it in my uh, practice. Thank you very much.